All right, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, as you can tell, I've, I've adapted the same dressing style in, than you have, which is dark colors, which I guess is a good thing for me. Um, I work as a futurist. Many of you may have a question what that even is. Uh, clearly, being a futurist is a strange profession because, after all, nobody knows the future. Uh, what I do as a futurist and with my company called the Futures Agency is that we try not to predict stuff but to develop foresights of what's coming. I've been doing this for roughly about 10 years. I've written five books. Uh, most of my time the last 10 years has been spent on media, content, internet, and telecom. This saying is sort of in a nutshell. Right? The purpose of looking at the future is to disturb the present. And I can't tell you how many people that I talk to, especially from media companies, who are deeply disturbed by what's happening now and in the future. Uh, just look at the music business. Now, I used to be a musician and producer. Um, and the last 10 years in the music business have bought a decline of 74% of revenues. Right? Not because people don't like music, but because of the change of what's happening in society and consumption. Um, if you want to follow me on Twitter, I have two handles. One is G. Leonhard, which is my more tech and media stuff, and then a green futurist is my, my green handle. So, in a nutshell, this is my job, listening to what's happening. There's a Chinese saying that says, if you want to know about the future, listen to your children. And there can't be more true than that. They know the future, because we don't have time to look. We're busy making money. Right? So this is a big issue for us, is that we, we actually know the future, but are we paying attention? We work with hundreds of clients all over the place, uh, big companies, technology companies, media companies, big brands, and so on. Uh, let me dive in. Last year, um, one of my clients is Telkom Indonesia, and last year I was lucky enough to go to Bali, uh, and I went to this fabulous place in Bali, and I'm sitting on the beach, okay, I notice every 40 minutes there's a bunch of people coming down the beach collecting plastic garbage. Right? I mean, this is the most beautiful place in the world, really, in Bali, right? You go in there and you're sitting on the beach and 850 tons of plastic garbage goes into rivers and the oceans in Bali a day. So we have a wicked problem, as people say, I think, in England rather than America. Right? We, have a, we have a really difficult problem. Right? That's all the stuff that we're doing is, is basically creating a huge amount of really bizarre situations, for example, having a beautiful place, but people throwing in a, away garbage in this way. We, we have a lot of issues here, and this is a thing I fished out of Tumblr the other day. It says, 10 years ago, we had Steve Jobs, Bob Hope, and Johnny Cash, very American, of course, now we have no jobs, no hope, no cash. Right? <clears throat> so a lot of people are deeply worried about this because you know, we're in a huge period of change. Right? I mean, this is the Occupy Wall Street movement is not just about a bunch of people talking about that they get the short end of the stick. Right? There's a lot of stuff behind these discussions. Right? Uh, so if you're worried about the future, check out this short clip I found the other day as fishing around about worried about the future. <laughs> so uh, check out this clip from Deutsche Post. In 2050, simply breathtaking, over 9 billion people, global mass consumption, climate change is accelerating. The rapid growth of world trade sets the pace for business and the economy. Vast transport networks supply the world with more and more goods. The planet is running hot. Even the systematic exploitation of natural resources cannot satisfy the appetite. Let's stop here because you guys all know what I'm talking about. I mean, there's plenty of scenarios that can scare you quite deeply. I mean, if you just watch the, uh, the former or the current chief of science for NASA speaking at TED, right, talking about what's basically coming, 97% uh, of the population around the world believes that climate change is real, and 93% of scientists have belief that it's real. This has really changed from the last a few decades. And, and basically, I think we're moving in our society from this view of basically that whatever makes money is fine, which is deeply ingrained, of course, in our society, right? I mean, in, in our lives, which basically is this scenario to a scenario of saying, okay, the next step really is a different emphasis, not on green per se, right? But on survival, right? And on, on having a different way of looking at how the world can be developed. So this is a huge substantial change. There's a great book you should read, The Third Industrial Revolution, by Jeremy Rifkin. Okay. He says in this book some very, very serious stuff, and this is really 
puts down the point. He says, basically, what's happening now, the conjoining of internet communication technology and renewable energy is bringing rise to the third industrial revolution. He says there's hundreds of millions of human beings that will be able to generate their own energy in their homes, offices, and share it. This is the key word, right? This sounds like Napster or something, right? Sharing energy, feeding it, sharing it into the grid. He calls this the intergrid, like the internet. Right? And this is one of the key points, I think, basically, if we're looking in this direction, that we can basically see what we have here is the convergence of this kind of internet philosophy and internet technology and renewable energy uh, called the intergrid. Now, clearly, I mean, if, if we see what's happening with the internet now, pretty soon there'll be five billion people connected, right? If we can have the same happening with energy and, and water and resources and, of course, other things, you know, that should be quite amazing futures. I think we're moving from, uh, to a future where we have less empires in the sense of, you know, the top, not even the 1%, less than the 1%. Uh, to moving a world of networks. I don't mean Facebook with this. I mean, Facebook is just an example. Right? But Facebook is the biggest broadcaster in the world now, at broadcasting us to each other, and Facebook is the second biggest country in the world. Right? It's almost as big as China. When Facebook goes public, they become a real country. Right? I mean, they, they become a country, and many people are worried about that Facebook may be somewhat distorted into just ook or something, whatever, because Clearly, that Facebook is looking at the same issues, you know, what do you do when you have this much power uh, and this much data from people? So, in a way, you know, this is one of my key terms that I use a lot of my clients. We're moving to a network society. A society that's basically completely interconnected. We can't make money without the other guys making money. Look at the business models of eBay, Amazon, Google, Skype, Twitter, and so on, right? It's all interconnected. Our society is now moving to a place of what Jeremy Rifkin calls lateral power. Lateral power meaning power that goes like this, right, rather than like this. Right? I mean, just 10 years ago, we had big telephone companies, big banks, big insurance companies, big governments, right, we still have big governments, big media companies. All of a sudden, what's happening is companies are growing like this, right? I mean, Google is a big company, but it's not a company like Universal Music or Walt Disney, right? It's much more decentralized and networked. And so a couple examples, you know, in Akiva allows people to uh, borrow money to each other through an online network, so you can actually fund somebody in Africa getting a loan. You may have seen those guys. Flipboard, you guys may be using a decentralized way of getting content. Um, if we're looking at this direction, we basically have things like the, uh, the, the smart grid, which feeds back stuff, right? It's basically the idea of lateral power rather than centralized power. And this is a fundamental business change as well, right? Because in centralized power, it's, it's all at the center rather than having a benefit for absolutely everyone. So as an example, you know, if you, it's a little hard to see these stats, right? But basically, the internet has had an explosive growth the last few years. If you're looking at the curves of data and all the other stuff, I mean, it's mind-boggling. And I think what's going to happen is that the very near future, renewable energy will grow even faster than the internet. Because clearly, it's one, one is, of course, depending on the other, right? Because we have the internet, we can actually exchange information and exchange funding as well. So this growth is absolutely mind-boggling. If you're looking at some of these stats, also taken from Jeremy's book, saying that basically the decline of cost of photovoltaic energy is 8% a year, half in the cost, and the Stanford University study saying that 20% of the available wind could provide seven times the electricity that we need, the power that we need around the planet. I mean, these things are obvious to all of us, right? But what does it mean? How, how can we change the system to actually work? I think uh, clearly that's why you guys are here. WWS, wind, water, sun, is the future of energy. Right? It's the future of the planet. And I'm not talking about in any philosophical way, right? This is clearly a business proposition as well, as a political proposition. So. Um, basically, what, what's happening here on the internet has shown this, that we're moving to a global sharing economy. Okay? Car sharing was mentioned earlier. The sharing proposition is everywhere. I mean, on the web, of course, we share music, we share information, we share YouTube, we share files, you know, we have Dropbox and so on. Information, ideas, energy. MIT has already put all of their courses online, called MIT Courseware. You can study at MIT online and not pay. This information is everywhere, and the same thing will happen with energy in the very near future. A new ecosystem 
based on shared resources. Now, many of you may be saying, well, sharing and, and uh, you know, this question in capital, and we're not talking about socialism here, right? And clearly socialism has failed, right? I mean, this is not a proposal of that sort of sharing. Right? It's the idea of saying, well, shared resources really is a very, very big part of what we're doing today. Kevin Kelly, the co-founder of Wired Magazine, he calls this the shared human awareness that we now have because we're all interconnected. If you're looking at other things, car sharing, we've talked about this already, Airbnb, where you can share your house with others and then in return rent theirs. Amazing place if you are going on vacation. Uh, sharing apps like Nike Plus and Path, where you can share your running information with other people. I mean, the sharing is everywhere. Spotify was a music service you can share with your friends. Shared electric grids, I mean, clearly, Rachel Boatsman calls this the collaborative consumption. Uh, she wrote a great book called What is, yours, uh, what is Mine is Yours. And this is a clear trend, you know, collaborating to consume together. She calls it, oops, sorry, I want, want to show this. She calls this a collaborative consumption going away from hyper consumption. This is clearly a, a key trend that we're seeing moving to reputation and shared assets. I mean, this is, of course, puts the fear of God into media companies, right? Because sharing is not good for them. <laughs> I mean, let's, let's face that the reality is that if we're all sharing resources and ideas and three billion people are coming online the next few years in Africa, India, and China, that's not good news for people who are not sharing. Right? And we know we're talking about big companies that are currently running the energy system, right? Collaborative consumption is a threat. I mean, if we're looking at all these examples, car sharing, right? The biggest factor in the car industry today is the rise of car sharing. And the second biggest, you wouldn't guess, is self-driving cars, self-driving electric cars. What does that have to do with the car business? Right? Airlines are now looking at virtually flying people. Right? What does that have to do with, air, with airplanes? Not much, right? But clearly that's the future that we're looking at, peer-to-peer, -peer, decentralized. YouTube basically killed MTV in two years. We still have MTV, right? but is anybody watching? I mean, the kids are all watching YouTube, and we're watching YouTube, right? It's decentralized. It's us making the program, and I think we're going to see exactly the same thing in energy, going the idea from the central grid to the idea of a decentral grid, the producer-consumer feeding power back into the grid. Right? Very much the same concept that we're seeing here. Now. I think there's a great movie you should watch. It's called Connected, the movie by Tiffany Schlein. She talks about how our entire society is moving to the place of being independent, you know, silos essentially and, and big mon 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 monopolies and cartels, to a society of being interdependent, right? interconnected. And I think this will be a huge challenge for us to change our business model to also be interdependent. And I would encourage you to look down this direction rather than the direction of independence. We used to all be like this, right? Companies who are broadcasters sending out their information, sending out their business models, now we're all like this. Right? We're decentralized, we're talking to each other, we're figuring out how to collaborate, we're crowdsourcing. I mean, if you see all the trends in business, clearly that's a huge threat. So as Marshall McLuhan said, we can be in a global village, which he said 1971, and Marshall McLuhan was actually talking about Facebook in 1971, the global village, right? So here's a choice you can make, consumers need to make very soon, do they want to live in a global village or a global desert, right? I mean, that is our choice. Right? It's a stark reality that we have to face, basically that is what we're looking at. So. Al Gore has said the bills are coming due. He says the environmental costs of providing what's called ecosystem services are, that was 1999, I think, already at $4 trillion. I think it's up to $6 trillion, what the environment has to bear to sustain our business activities. These costs are coming due, and Einstein says, you know, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we use to create them. Tell that our politicians, right? Tell that people who are making those decisions. A fraction of the money spent on military, on having a new ecosystem of renewable energy and renewable resources, right, would solve all of these problems. Right? I mean, clearly, this is not a question of whether it works or not, or whether we need it or not. It's a question of deciding. 
So I think so-called externalities, you know, the external costs that we haven't covered, must become part of the P&L, the profit and loss statement of each company. So Puma has done this and they said they're going to calculate the costs of the ecosystem into the price of their products. Of course, you know, if you do that, then you have this, right? I mean, clearly, if you do that, it gets a lot more expensive. I mean, this is why the Chinese airlines don't want to pay the carbon fare when they come to Europe, right? Because it gets more expensive. But do we have a choice? I mean, clearly, we have to calculate the costs of these so-called externalities. Right? And that's going to happen in the next couple of years. And I think the European Union is taking the lead, which is a good thing in this respect. I think we're going to see the end of what I call short-termism. ROI is the holy grail, right? I mean, basically, companies think on a quarterly level, if they're on the stock market, maybe a half year level or even a year, right? But it's all about return on money. And that will kill us. And that is killing us. I mean, clearly, if you are investing on this turf, you need to have a long term plan, right? Three to five year plan and longer than that. And I think that's going to become a standard. I think essentially game over for short term planning. And I would say that in a couple of years, three to, three to five years from now, the stock market is going to reward companies who are not saying we're going to grow the next quarter or the next year, who are not saying that you have continuous growth just because you have to have growth. And it brings me to a sore subject. You know, clearly, global warming is the biggest market failure in history. I mean, if you're arguing that there's a business opportunity in fixing a problem, but it's not being fixed, right? I mean, clearly, we have a business problem here. We have climate change, right? We have global warming. So why hasn't it been addressed? Can a free market do that? Address such a large problem? Can we grow our way out? Now, this is, of course, a very American thing. You know, I live in Switzerland now, but I used to live in America for 17 years, so I've become half Americanized, right? In America, you'd say, well, if there's a problem, let's apply resources, we'll get a bunch of investors, then we make lots of money and we solve the problem. Okay. But can we grow our way out of this? I mean, this is a serious question that we have to ask. You know, uh, Maslow said, when the only tool is, you own is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. We have to question our toolbox there as well. And in America, of course, many people are feeling this way now. Say so basically, this is putting the gun to our head to make money with whatever we're doing, right? So I would put that out as an open question. But clearly, there is a connection between the rise of global temperatures, global warming, and the expanding middle class. I mean, look at those two graphs. Right? Look at how temperatures have gone up the last couple of years and how the middle class is expanding. I mean, clearly, we have a huge challenge here. This is not a challenge of technology unless you have a magic wand that can solve this problem in a, in a decade. So there's four different approaches here. Many of you are working on this. So I think they're all going to be a mixed back in the future. We have companies dealing with efficiency, which is, must be done as a great approach to this. We have game changers, magic wands. I'll explain that in a minute. We have to face reduced consumption. I mean, the solution to uh, Air traffic and having less pollution through airplanes is not necessarily to have better engines, which is part of it, right? But it's to not fly. I mean, I should be talking, right? I have to fly more now, not less. Right? And then we have sustainability. Those four things are going to mix and solve the problem in the future, but it won't be either one of the, by, uh, those things by themselves. Here's a game changer. There's no sound on this. This is Dean Kamen. He's an inventor in San Francisco. He just invented a box uh, called the sling box. And this thing can take any water source, not radioactive, but anything, you know, it can have animals in it if you want. It makes a thousand liters of water a day from any source, any source, any, any murky water, whatever you've got, okay, it, through a vaporizing mechanism. Coca-Cola has invested in this company now. They want to roll out this box worldwide to solve the water problem. This is what I call a magic wand. You know, this is like, you know, carbon sequestration, same sort of idea. Or the space elevator to capture sun energy, right? Those are magic wands. How real they are, I don't know. We'll find out. But I think we we'll need to fund more of those game changers. We have to put more money into people inventing radical stuff. 
I mean, there's lots of it out there. So money needs to shift there, and I think there has to be public money and private money, of course, both. But clearly also this will be part of our future. This Patagonia, with the biggest ad campaign in 2007, 2010, was don't buy this jacket. Why would somebody who sells something have a campaign that says don't buy what I, what I sell? I mean, that sounds kind of like you go to a beer garden and it says don't drink beer. But this campaign has worked, right? has worked for Patagonia as a brand. Now they sell on eBay the used stuff. So consumption clearly is an issue that we also have to face. I think we're looking at a rebooting of capitalism. And again, just to clarify, this has nothing to do with alternatives to capitalism, right? but a different shape of it. I mean, there's, if you look at the buzz last three months, you know, this is why I'm writing my next book. It's called From Ego to Eco. It's all this debate about how this cost could possibly work. We're looking at, you know, clearly uh, the book by Omer Haig, The Capitalist Manifesto, what Al Gore has been saying about sustainable capitalism, right? This is a major challenge to the system. The system of money, system of business, the system of investment, the system of countries. So I think what's going to happen there in the very uh, near future is that we all have to put up with this question. How can we have capitalism that is actually sustainable? Tough question. So uh, in this regard, I think what's going to happen in the next five years, I said this before, sustainable becomes the new profitable. Basically, in five years, every person, every politician, every company, every businessman, every futurist, every author, every, everybody will be judged by how sustainable their approach is to what they're doing. This will completely flip today. It's sort of an optional thing. Right? If you're looking at big companies like Unilever, Procter & Gamble, and so on, they're making a huge effort, Walmart in the US, right, to do this already. This will become a total standard. And if you don't do it, you will not be rewarded by your shareholders. It's going to flip upside down from what we have today. Environment, equality, human rights, what's called thick value and equality. So Peter Diamandis in his book, Abundance, that you should read, you know, he's the guy who does the XPRIZE and quite an interesting character. He has a great video out in, on the TED channel. Okay? He says basically in the next few years, we're going to have another 3 billion people coming online, which brings a boost of ideas and energy into the system. This should be a boon for innovation, not just for consumption. Right? And basically, he says what uh, three billion minds can do, you know, create, discover, desire, invent. This is a huge opportunity for all of us to tap into. Umair Haig talks in his book about how value chains have to become value cycles. Right? And this is going to be a challenge. I mean, uh, Looking at traditional business, you know, you have a chain of value and most of that gets uh, stuck on one end, which is what I do. Right? But now, in the future, we're looking at a system to where we have to invent stuff that comes around, that goes in cycles, right? that comes 100% back. So the trend, for example, for companies to build buildings with solar energy and so on, that can be completely self-contained and off the grid actually feed power back into the grid. Right? Same idea. So value chains to value cycles, I think that's going to be our future. Uh, looking at what Unilever has done, for example, it says they commit to three outcomes by 2020. It's one of my clients, so just to divulge this. One billion people to take action to improve their health and well-being, 100% of agricultural sustainably, what they're sourcing. So they have big goals there, right? big, big hairy goals. Right? And clearly that's going to happen in all industries, in all companies in all countries. So just as the internet is distributed and decentralized, the future of power is the same. Distributed, collaborative, transparent. Right? Why does not every single home have a smart grid where I can watch on my iPhone what I'm consuming? That should be a requirement right? to make me aware of what I'm doing. You may have heard about the so-called Prius effect. Right? When you drive a Prius, which is not a very good car, you know, I have a Lexus, but it's the same engine. Right? You can't really do much with it in terms of speeding or having fun, right? So what you're doing is you're watching how low of a consumption you have. Right? That's called the Prius effect. Right? And then you're sharing with others. So there's millions of people already sharing their driving results online and competing who can drive the cheapest. Right? That's called the Prius effect. We need the Prius effect in our homes, in our lives, right? that we can compare actually and help each other out to risk certain goals, just like Nike Plus does it for runners. 
So uh, uh, Ray Kurzweil says, a kid in Africa with a smartphone has more information today than the president of the US 15 years ago. We have to use that information to drive this process of change. We have to look at things that we can do. Their future of power clearly is, as we have seen, in that process of connecting with others. So as a comparison, you'll see some very interesting points here. Right? The future of media, newspapers, music, films, is the same thing, right? All of a sudden, it's distributed, it's collaborative. There's like a, a dozen different things, or, or 50 different, 100 different things that make money, not just one thing. So this is a very good parallel, I think, that we should entertain here. So one of my key words here is that we're moving from a society of hyper-competition. You know, I'm 50 years old, so I, you know, I was actually part of that old system, in parentheses, right, where you hyper-compete down to the destruction of the other party. Right? Today, we have to hyper-collaborate to the benefit of all parties. And there's a huge shift here, right? also because of speed. I mean, clearly, the issues we're facing are not issues of one country, one company, one city. Right? They are, we have to hyper-collaborate. So here we have a development where we can clearly say, and this is a reflection of what's happening on the web, trust is the new currency. Are people going to trust your company with your innovation, what you're rolling out to change the situation? Are, are they going to trust your opinion? Right? Remember, for example, in the US, where I do a lot of speaking, if you mention the word climate change, you're off the stage. Right? Because you just can't mention it. Right? It's too, uh, it's like saying, you know, saying something bizarre from your sex life or something. You get kicked off the stage, right? Because it's a no-no topic. Right? Because of the distortion of trust around the topic of whether it's true. I mean, clearly, of course, it's just as true as that Facebook is a country that we have climate change. Right? So, Cluster, uh, trust being the new, comp uh, the new uh, currency, now trust also requires transparency. You may have seen this video from FedEx. Here's a guy delivering a package, it was last week, and nobody's there but his security camera is on. So the guy goes and drops the, the computer monitor over the fence, right? And this was put up on the internet from the guy, of course, he had watched the whole time, right? And there were 8 million views in about 13 hours, right? and the stock went down, they had this huge thing, right? And here's another video from a peaceful demonstration in Sacramento, California on the Occupy movement, and a policeman steps up without, like, you know, doling out the, uh, the wine in church, he doles out the pepper spray, right? And this kind of transparency we're going to see everywhere, right? Basically, the entire world is transparent now, so you as a company have to be part of this movement. This is a major change to us. So a quick summary, and maybe we have time for some questions. So my main theory is we're moving from an ego society, an egonomy, to an eco society, from an ego system to an ecosystem. Not eco in the sense of green necessarily, in the sense of connected, right? in the sense of interdependent, and of course in the sense of ecological. Uh, we're moving to a society where we have an intergrid, just like we have the internet, and this is a trillion dollar opportunity, of course, clearly but a huge shift of paradigm because it goes two ways, from the network to the networked. Renewable energy will be grow, growing faster than the internet. This is going to be quite a challenge, I think, for many countries, many people. Uh, wind, water, sun is the future. Hyperconsumption replaced by collaborative consumption. I mean, imagine what that will do is the idea of saying that we, we don't own cars, we don't own houses, we, we share them. Right? We, temporarily lend them out. Idea of lateral power. That really changes our business processes. Global warming as a market failure. And defining sustainable capitalism. I mean, this, this clearly is our job, right? I mean, how do we make money with this? We can't lose money with all of it, right? But how do we sustain it? Right? I mean, this is clearly going to be a key question. From hyper-collaboration to hyper uh, hyper-competition to hyper-collaboration. This is uh, a very important topic, I think, for the future. Value chains to value cycles. And in the end, this is the overriding topic. So I want to thank you very much.